Hello and welcome to Victory On Demand. We hope that the message you're about to watch helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in some way that helps you take your next step. We want to connect with you and we know that life is busy and that you may be watching this on maybe a Tuesday afternoon or a sun Saturday morning or some other day of the week that isn't Sunday. And, and that's the beauty of On Demand, uh, that, that God can use any of the other 167 hours of the week to connect us back to Him. But we wanna be able to include you as part of our church family and to help take you to your next step wherever that may be. So let us know that you're here by clicking that button that's popping up on your screen right now. No matter who you are, where you are, or, or what you're struggling with, our goal is to equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word that you would truly experience something more, something better. If you haven't experienced a live victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.live for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. We're so glad that you've chosen to be a part of Victory today, and we hope that you enjoy this message. Christmas is coming, and they're coming too, bringing some gifts and some baggage for you. One day, two day, three days or more, how do we survive those we adore? Your boss, whose idea of a holiday gift is making you work a long double shift. Your date for mom's dinner, who still lives at home and is not well acquainted with hard work or a comb. Perhaps it's your spouse who's on your last nerve and you'd like to give them just what they deserve. Regifting that sweater, which you know is too small, or coal in the stocking, or maybe nothing at all. Whomever the problem, whatever the reason, we all want to care for others this season. Yet friends and family, much loved though they be, can create much drama and much misery. What's to be done with all the confusion? Might we suggest an unsettling solution? Then they hit a little too close to home. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Yeah, what we're doing is right now in this moment for the next few weeks, we're going to be pointing our hearts and lies toward a little bit different this year towards Christmas. And, and normally what I get to do to you, do with you is like give you all these historical accounts of the events leading up to Christmas. But this Christmas season is going to be a little bit different. We're going to use this series to do, get a clearer picture of what and who we are actually celebrating when we celebrate Christmas. In fact, if you're on the edges of faith, my, my prayer is that you would walk away with a deeper understanding of the original version of, of Christianity. And if you're a Jesus follower, my prayer is that you would sense a deep peace wash over you and that you would actually get to share what you've experienced when, when we talk about following Jesus. And so as we go to Christmas parties and, and make our plans and cook our meals and go to family gatherings and get this, as the people we love, you remember that. We love these people. If they drive us crazy about you, we love them, right? They're going to frustrate us, break our heart, and surprise us. But, but our time together, we're going to be preparing our hearts and minds for experiencing them this Christmas. And we're going to investigate the unsettling solution to almost everything. And to kick off our time together, I know I'm kind of naive to, to wonder this, and you can criticize me later for it, but here's what I've been thinking. I just don't know why everybody wouldn't want Christianity to be true. I don't know why everybody wouldn't want it to be true. With all of the hope and all of the meaning and all the promises, it, that God doesn't make mistakes, that you look around, there's not a mistake in the room. That God doesn't create confusion. He created the way you are, right, on purpose, with a purpose, that he wants you to step into your God-given identity, that Jesus came to save us from our sin, and the, the idea that God isn't just for us. No, he's promised to be with us. Like, no matter what we've done, no matter how far we've, we've run, that he paid the price for us to, to come back, to be connected back to him. And I just don't understand the, the, the version of Christianity I'm talking about like, it might be like way different than what you grew up with, but till my dying day, I just, I don't know why everybody wouldn't want Christianity, the original version, the Jesus' irresistible version of Christianity 
to be true. And so just to be clear, I, I realize there are some people maybe here, here or watching online that just say, hey, Josh, I just don't believe it's true, right? In fact, if you're here today and you're not sure you believe it's true, that it's okay to ask for more information. It's okay to, to need a little more evidence. If you're not sure you believe it's true, I'm so glad you came to Victory because at Victory, you can belong way before you believe everything. But there's a difference between I don't believe it's true and I don't want it to be true. And I've met people who don't want it to be true. I just, I, I just don't understand that when confronted with the original version of Jesus and the claims of Jesus and the life of Jesus, even if they never end up actually believing it, I don't understand why they just wouldn't want it to be true. Uh, Blase Pascal, 17th century mathematician philosopher, he says it this way. He says, people are almost invariably arrived at their beliefs, not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive, right? And so this explains so much of conversations maybe you had with your kids or you were raising your kids or, because there's some things that kids want to believe are true, like in middle school, they want to believe are true in high school, they think they know are true in college, right? Or maybe you think you know some things that are true because we find the idea of them or the things of, the, the, the ideas are attractive, People are almost always invariably arrive at their beliefs, not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. In other words, when something is attractive to us, we look for reasons to believe it. Now, th this is important. He, he's not saying that something's, if something's attractive, therefore it's true. And I'm not even trying to argue that since Christianity is attractive, therefore it's true. My, my point and my thought behind this is, and Christianity in its original form is so extraordinarily attractive. I just don't understand why my, people in our times don't want it to be true. Even if intellectually they just can't get there. Because the original version of Christianity is so very attractive. Like in the beginning, people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And Jesus liked them back. People who were nothing like Jesus, completely different than Jesus, like Jesus, and Jesus liked them back, which made and Jesus and Christianity so attractive, it, makes, it boils down to really one word. It's a word that makes me want to believe that it's true. It's the, it's the unsettling solution for just about everything, and it's this word right here. It's, it's, it's grace. Grace. And grace is what we crave most when our guilt is exposed it's what we crave most when our guilt is exposed. Let me explain it this way. You came home late and your parents were there and they're sitting there and they're, they've got the stuff on the table and they know what's yours and you know what's yours. There's no excuses, no loopholes. No, I think it's my sister's, none of that, right? You know the punishment and you know it's gonna be, there's, it's gonna be painful and worse than that, you know you should be punished. Grace is what we crave most when our guilt is exposed. Maybe you're a husband or a wife and you spent too much and you're trying to hide it Maybe you didn't do what you said you would do or your boss confronts you on something that you actually did and there's really no excuse for what you did. There's really no point in making excuses. There are no loopholes. There's no one to blame but you and you know you should be punished. You know the punishment will be painful. And grace, that's what we crave most when our guilt is exposed. But there's the flip side to Grace. This holiday season, think family gathering, right? They think when your spouse watches the next episode on Netflix, when you agree to watch it together, right? That's really painful stuff like that. Like, so so when you were hurt and you were harmed and you were wrong, grace is what we're hesitant to extend when confronted with the guilt of others. What we're hesitant to extend when we're actually confronted with the guilt of others. Like you wronged me, you hurt me. And the reality is, is I don't want to forgive you. And so here, here's the reality. When we're on the receiving end of grace, it's refreshing. It's relieving. We have hope. But when grace is required from you, when grace is required from me, it is disturbing. It is unsettling. Do you, do you sense the tension of grace? In this Christmas season, it is the solution that will repair your relationships. So as we walk through our, this series, think about your relationships. Think about the good relationships or the bad ones, the ones you're trying to repair or the ones that someone's trying to repair with you. In fact, grace is so transformative that even if you don't even follow Jesus, but you apply what Jesus says, it will make your relationships better. It will make the lives of the people you care about better. Now, 
If you grew up in church, you may have had a definition of grace, and that's fine. You can keep your definition. But for this series, we're going to use this definition, that grace is undeserved, unearned, unearnable favor. Grace is undeserved, unearned, unearnable favor. It means that someone's leaning in your direction when they have every right to lean away. It's that someone you know uh, you should pursue because you hurt them, but they actually initiate this conversation with you. But, but grace is really strange because no matter what you, you've done to change, there's nothing you can do to deserve grace. In fact, the minute you think you deserve grace, it's kind of like planning your own surprise party. Once you plan it, it stops being a surprise. I mean, just... The minute you think you deserve grace, you actually void all the grace that you think you deserve. So that means that you and I, we can ask for grace, we can beg for grace, we can plead for grace, we can even say grace. You know, she passed away 30 years ago. Like uh, National Lampoons, no? But the minute you think you deserve it, it's no longer grace. And grace, the concept of grace and the idea of grace is really so complex and because we won't even be able to receive grace until you and I are convinced that we don't deserve it. In fact, whenever you see someone crying in our baptistry, what I feel like they're experiencing is, is grace. Because they knew that there was nothing they could do to deserve it. And one more thing about grace, it, it can only be experienced in the context of a relationship. So grace is purely, purely relational. It's always in a relationship where there's an imbalance in the relationship. So think about someone you are in debt to, like, and you don't have the ability to pay them back. And that's why Christianity is so very attractive. You see, when you go back to the beginning and read about how Jesus interacted with people, this might shock you, but Jesus, he basically had this two-part message. And remember, he's God. He can say whatever he wants. Message number one is simply this, you're hopelessly lost. In other words, it's worse than you thought. Things are really, really bad for you. You are hopelessly lost. But then here's the good news is God sent me to find you, right? Right? So so you have to know at its core, Christianity isn't about self-help or morality, but it's about divine rescue. That Jesus, he would talk to someone and basically share this two-part message. And message number one would simply be this, you're a sinner. (laughs) So you're not a mistaker. It wasn't an accident. It's worse than you thought. You're a dirty sinner. But here's the good news. God loves sinners. And I have come on your behalf to pay for your sins. That when you study the life of Jesus, you discover that Jesus didn't come so that you and I could hide our sins. He didn't come from heaven to earth to complain about our sins. He didn't come from heaven to earth to to shame us for our mistakes. No, at its core, Christianity isn't about self-help, but divine rescue. And that's what we celebrate when we celebrate Christmas, God's amazing Grace, But the reality is we would never have known about this amazing grace if not for the person of Jesus. If you have your Bible or mobile device, go ahead and turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 is about the middle of your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 1. And that we're going to be reading uh, through the New Testament this next year. If you've never, uh, starting in January, so if you've ever read through the New Testament or if you've never finished reading through the New Testament, we have a plan to do it together. So be looking for more information on that. John, think about this. John who wrote this is John who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus, was an eyewitness of the crucifixion and the resurrection. And John writes this letter at at an old age. So he's outlived Peter and Andrew. He's outlived James, the brother of Jesus. John's an old man and all of the other disciples have, have already passed away. And with all of this hindsight, looking back, Matthew has already been written. Luke's account has already been distributed. It's already been written. And John and Matthew and Mark as well. And so John is writing and giving his own perspective on what he experienced. And he begins this account of this life with Jesus. And the way he begins it is so much different than what we normally read at Christmas. In fact, at Christmas, we normally read Matthew and Luke. And, right? we, they normally get talked about the most at Christmas. But John writes uh, the Christmas account and he does it different so different that we almost never read it. So he he gives us insight to the person of Jesus. He says this, in the beginning was the word, and the word is, is Jesus. So in the beginning was the word Jesus, and the word Jesus was with God, and the word Jesus was God. Okay, that's how he kicks off. So if you scroll down to verse 14, this is how John writes his Christmas account. You ready? You're thinking angels and manger and baby and ah. But he says, the word became, uh, Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling 
among us. The message version says it this way, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Don't you like that? So this is God in a bod. Like this is God inhabited in a body. God came to earth. And then he says this, we, the disciples, we, the eyewitnesses, have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. And then he uses this describer word. You'll see it all throughout the gospels. He says that he's full of grace and what? Truth. So not the balance of grace and truth. That's what you and I try to pull off. Right, Not the balance of grace and truth. Anytime you try to balance grace and truth, you lose your balance. Right? It's a little more grace. It's a little more truth. So Jesus was full on grace and full on truth all the time. So wherever Jesus went, he gave full doses of grace and full doses of truth. Now, naturally, I think you and I, we either lean towards grace or truth. I mean, think about the people that you know. Right? They're either grace people or truth people. Some of us are grace people and some of us are truth people. Maybe you have a version of Christianity that you grew up with that was all truth, and that's kind of hard to deal with because, in fact, the very moment that you, that, that, that you do something wrong, they kick you out of that church because they're giving you what you deserve, right? You do deserve it, but, but, but you need some grace. And then there's the churches that all have all grace, and they don't work either, mainly because they're not any different than the world around us. They won't produce life change or hope. So grace or truth doesn't work. I don't know what kind of church you've experienced in the past, but you need to know no matter what version of church you end up attending, grace or truth does not work. It will never work because when Jesus shows up, he wasn't grace or truth. No, no, that's, it's, he was full on grace and full on truth. In fact, Jesus never watered down the truth and he never turned down the grace either. He called sin a sin. He called sinners sinners. And then he laid down his life for all of us sinners. He was all grace, all truth, all the time. And this concept of God was brand new. The idea that John the Boyce communicated to everybody that that, that God was love, that was brand new, that God could love us as we are, like we are. And the only reason that John could conclude that God was love is because they saw love. They saw Jesus in a body. And then what we discover is that love comes from the God is is simply this. Love is all grace, all truth, all the time. Because Jesus was all grace, all truth, all the time. But to experience it was unsettling. John witnessed it when he was there that very awkward noon when Jesus asked a dirty tax collector to follow him. That was an unsettling moment. Everyone else hated Matthew. Even his own family disowned Matthew. They considered Matthew to be a traitor. And as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. And Jesus invites Matthew. He simply says, follow me. Get this, before he asks them to believe anything, before he asks them to obey anything, before he even repents, Jesus looks at him and says, would you follow me? And Matthew says, got up and followed him. And then something crazy happened. Jesus invites Matthew to, invites himself over to Matthew's house. So Matthew was throwing a party with his other tax collecting friends. And this is how Matt remembers it. He says, while Jesus was having uh, dinner at my house, many tax collectors and sinners. And I love that because the tax collectors are so bad, the sinners would be offended if you lump them in, right? So so we're not just sinners, we're tax collectors and sinners, ate with him and, and his disciples. They had to to be the most hated group in all of Israel. And Jesus' disciples were upset. They were unsettled. They they were thinking, Jesus, what are we doing here? We're one of the good guys. We don't belong with people like this. And I'm telling you, people nothing like Jesus actually liked being around Jesus. And apparently Jesus liked them back. But I'll admit, if you were there to witness it for yourself, it would have felt really awkward it would have been unsettling. I want you to kind of maybe think about it this way. You're at a party with all of your closest crazy friends. So some of you, you might need to think back to like a college time or a dark time in your life. Picture yourself at a party with all of your wild crazy friends and they're all drunk. Now you didn't endorse everything. It's not your party. You're just at the party. Not, but not only that, but everyone, you know, they're just, they're just going crazy. And so you got that picture in your head, right? And you, hopefully you're not saying it was last night, but if it was, I'm glad you're here, right? So, so crazy party scene, and everyone's a little bit more than tipsy, and I, my wife and I walk in. And I realize I'm like a party downer everywhere I go. 
you might like me on Sundays, but you won't like me on Saturday night, right? So it's like, Josh and Becky are here. How long are you guys going to stay? You guys thinking like 10 minutes, five minutes, three minutes? How long do you think you might be planning to stay, right? And as, as soon as we, we leave, one of your wild friends goes, let's get this party started, you know, and I hear it, you know, like that. All right, so Jesus is the house of Matthew, a tax collector, and just his presence alone is unsettling because Jesus embodied grace, undeserved, unearned, unearnable favor. But before Jesus leaves, the only people that seem to care about the truth show was up. The Pharisees show up, and they're judging everybody, and they're looking down on everybody. And here's the thing that gets me. When the people far from God saw them, they thought that those Pharisees represented what God thought about them. They thought that must be what God is, is like. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Pete's going, that's a great idea. I don't know why. I want to get out of here. Like, we shouldn't be with them. We should be eating with you. And Pete thinks, hey, they're right. Why are we even here? And one of them goes to Jesus and Jesus says, on hearing this, Jesus said, don't call Matthew and his friends sinners. That may hurt their feelings. They may raise your taxes. I'm trying to be grace to these people. Jesus didn't say that. No, what Jesus says is way more unsettling because love is and Jesus is all grace and all truth all of the time. This is what Jesus says. It is not, on hearing this, Jesus says, not the healthy who need a doctor, but the what? And Matthew's like, Jesus, time out. You're calling me sick? You're at my house. To which Jesus would say, Matthew, you know you're sick. You're stealing from your own people. You're sick, but I still want you to follow me. Even though you're sick, I want you to follow me. Jesus is all love and all truth, all, of the, all grace, all the time. I'm going to paraphrase the, what I think Jesus did next. I worked on it pretty hard. Here you go. I, Jesus said this, I'm not afraid to call a sinner a sinner, and I'm not afraid to go to their house for dinner. <laughs> you think? No. This is all grace and all truth. Maybe we could live this out. I'm not afraid to call a sinner a sinner, and I'm not afraid to go to their house for dinner. I'm telling you, the people who were nothing like Jesus actually liked hanging out with Jesus, and this blew everybody's mind that Jesus actually liked them back. Why? Because he was all grace and all truth all of the time. Grace and truth are a common theme all throughout John. In fact, another event that John was an eyewitness of that he would never forget was found in John chapter 8, when one day when Jesus is teaching and all of those truth-filled Pharisees, they drag a woman and throw her in front of Jesus. And it says, the Pharisees brought, a, a woman, they brought in a woman, and she had been caught committing adultery. So she's been caught in her worst moment, and they bring the woman, and only the woman, because this is a trap. They were trying to take Jesus out, and they're willing to kill this woman to do it. So no mercy, no love, no compassion, no grace. And they say to Jesus, teacher... This, this woman was caught sleeping with a man who was not her husband. And the law of Moses commanded us to kill such women by throwing stones at them. Now what do you say? And Jesus is so brilliant because he doesn't say anything. He says he bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. This is the only time recorded in scripture where we find that Jesus writes. And not only that, Jesus mimics what God did when God actually gave Moses the Old Testament law way back in Exodus. Now, we don't know what Jesus writes, but I think he writes some of the Pharisees' sins. And the Pharisees are yelling at Jesus, demanding that he make a decision. And Jesus is so brilliant, he lets them make the decision. He says, let anyone who, who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And then Jesus, the one who just saved her, he does something unsettling. Jesus ruins the moment. He leans down to her and looks in her eyes and he says, go and leave your life of what? Sin. Not, not that you're fine, you had a tough upbringing, you're just doing the best you can. No, I know your story. You weren't trying to hurt anybody. No, Jesus is all grace and all truth all the time. So he said, I saved you. I rescued you. I want you to leave this life. This is, I know you're guilty, but I just saved you. And I want to follow, I want you to follow me. I have a better life for you. But first you have to leave this. And over and over again, Jesus would lean into people who had not acknowledged their sin and not initiated a relationship with God while they were still sinners. Jesus invited them to follow him. Why? 
Because at its core, Christianity is not about self-help or even morality. It's about divine rescue. No event shows this more than that of the one where John witnessed about three years after he started following Jesus. John witnessed the ultimate unsettling expression of grace and truth. John was there, but Luke records that at the crucifixion, this is what he says. Two, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him, Jesus, to be executed. Why? Because in the first century, religion had decided grace and truth was so unsettling, we're going to have to kill it. So I, we, they understood all of grace, and they believed the way to God was only truth. So to them, it was like either or, but all grace, all truth, all the time, we can't handle that. We're going to have to murder it. It was way too unsettling. And so the text continues. It says, when they uh, came to the place called the skull, they crucified Jesus our modern stomach can't handle the details of what was next, but in the first century, they lived this out. No details were needed. They had all seen a crucifixion. They all remember hearing the cries and the screams of those being crucified, and they've all smelled the aftermath of the crucifixion. So there's no reason to give all the details. So when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him, Jesus, there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And the Pharisees, the truth even sneered at him and they said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. Not only are they killing him, they're mocking him as they do it, the embodiment of grace and truth. And then it gets worse. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. And get this, Jesus says nothing. Bowl of grace absorbing the venom. He's going to take it. He's going to carry all of that criminal's anger with him till his death. But the other criminal rebuked him. And he said something so interesting. Now remember, these are crucifixion victims. So just to breathe, they had to push up on the nails on their feet and pull up on the nails in their arms just to, to, to breathe, to gasp a breath. And so every word that he utters is painful. And what he says is so interesting. He goes, don't you fear God? Since you're under the same sense, we are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds, what? Deserve. That's the cold, hard truth. But this man has done nothing wrong. In other words, if the kingdom of heaven is reserved for good people, and if the kingdom of heaven is reserved for righteous people, moral people, if the kingdom of heaven is reserved for people who get it right every time, if that's the truth, we have no hope. We have no chance, but he does. And so in his last de desperation act, a criminal who deserved death, he turns to Jesus and he makes a final request. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To which the other people in the audience had to be going like, what? All right, this is crazy. What's he doing? Why is he asking this? This guy is seriously asking to go to God to forgive him as he's dying? Like everybody knows repenting from a cross is meaningless, right? From God now on, I'll never. <laughs> from God now on, I'll obey everything you said. For God, as long as I'm alive, I'll be good. It's like, great, 30 minutes? Like we start the clock now. Like re repenting from a cross is meaningless. This guy has nothing to promise. This guy has nothing to offer. And from the cross, this criminal is hanging next to Jesus, and Jesus says something so unsettling. He does something so unthinkable. Now, before I tell you what Jesus says, let me just ask you this. I think most of you probably ask this. Does God hear the prayers of sinners? You ever wonder that? Does, does God actually even hear the prayers of, of sinners? I want to tell you, those are the only prayers God hears. We're all sinners. So Jesus answered him. Remember, every word is filled with pain. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, today you will be what? With me in paradise. And this passage is so unsettling. And that reality of the cross was so gruesome. The criminal was getting what he deserved. And the grace of Jesus in that moment is offensive. Because that means that that criminal would join Bartholomew. Bartholomew, who was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, who would later be skinned alive because he followed Jesus. This criminal gets to join bold Peter, brave Peter, who would later be crucified. 
This criminal will get to join James, John's brother. The guy who wrote this brother was beheaded because he followed Jesus. They were all killed, not because they were a criminal like that criminal. No, because they wouldn't stop telling the world about Jesus. And this criminal gets, gets, gets the same fate as those heroes. They get the gift of, of grace, undeserved, unearned, unearnable favor. And that's unsettling. It's unsettling, isn't it? But like life, grace is not fair. Like life, grace is not fair. In fact, it's better than fair. It's unsettlingly better than fair. Because Jesus is, and love is all grace and all truth all the time. And that's why Jesus paid the price to make us right with him. And then he resurrected from the dead. He comes back to life to let us know that Jesus, when we turn to him, he has the power over sickness. He has the power over disease. He has the power over weather. He has the power over life. He even has power over death. And that's why the original version of Christianity was absolutely fearless, because they served a resurrected Savior. They experienced grace and truth in a person, and they did their best to live out that grace and truth until their dying day. Why did they do that? Because that's what Jesus' followers do. And so if you follow Jesus, I just need to ask you, who do you need to extend grace to this Christmas season? They don't deserve it. They can't earn it. And hear me, I'm not suggesting you go put yourself in an abusive situation, but who do you need to extend grace to this Christmas season? And think of whatever it is that unsettles you. Maybe it's the family gatherings. Maybe it's the work relationship or your spouse or your kids. But who do you need to extend grace to this Christmas season? You know, if you follow Jesus, you've got to do that. Because that's what Jesus' followers do. Jesus is all grace, all truth, all the time. Now, if you're not a Jesus follower, or you're on the edges of Christianity, I just want to ask you this. Don't you want this to be true? Like, I understand if you don't believe that it's true, and I understand if you need more information, but don't you at least want that to be true? If that's you, make a plan right now to come back next week as we uncover more of this account. The Apostle Paul, uh, he sums it up for us in this a great way. He says, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why? Because at its core, Christianity is not about self-help or even morality. It's divine rescue. And that's what we get to celebrate this Christmas season. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you so much that you've come from heaven to earth to show us that God is love. That, that even though we are sinners, that you love us, that you pursued us, that you have a plan for us. And Father, I, I just pray that in this moment, as we draw near you, we would sense you drawing near us. And Father, I just pray that you would give us the wisdom to see as you see, and then the courage to do as you say this Christmas season. So in Jesus' name I pray. Thank you so much for joining us for Victory On Demand. Here at Victory, we believe that we all have a next step, and we pray that God uses what you've experienced here today to stir something in your life and to lead you to the next step in your faith journey, whatever that may be. If you'd like to talk to someone about taking your next step, please let us know by clicking the button that's popping up on your screen right now. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given to us. We celebrate generosity in the work that God does through our sacrificial giving in our community and around the world. If your experience today has helped you or blessed you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God by going to victorycc.live slash give. Again, if you haven't experienced a live victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. Remember, here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. We'll see you next time.